It's the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. <laughs> yeah, it is. But it's not just any Ross Tucker Football Podcast. It is a Monster Monday presented, of course, by DraftKings. And there is a ton of stuff going on right now in the NFL, like a ton, which is why I had to bring in my good buddy, a uh, former colleague at Sirius XM NFL radio, Booger McFarland. You see him all over ESPN. He'll join us momentarily to talk about all the big news that's happened just since Thursday's show. It's pretty crazy. Uh, it is a new week, which means we will have a new spread the word winner. We'll have a new sponsor confirmation email winner, and we will have a new YouTube shout out winner. You guys know how to do all of that stuff at Ross Tucker NFL, youtube.com slash Ross Tucker NFL. It's big show time. The big show. Always good to see my buddy Booger McFarland. Uh, you know, it's funny. We did a show once a week together. I don't know. We just hit it off and. I see what the network's giving these other people. If any network was smart, they would just get Booger and I to do a show, and (laughs) it would absolutely take off. Booger, good to see you, buddy. Thanks for coming on the show. Anytime, Ross. Glad to be here, man. Glad to be back on the mic with you, buddy. All right, so check him out on social media, at ESPN Booger. That's the key to always know Booger's thoughts, what he's up to, et cetera. And I want to start, Booger, it's funny, When I texted you Thursday, it's like a million things have happened since then. The latest is that supposedly, and maybe by the time some people listen to this or watch it, we should find out Deshaun Watson's initial suspension from Sue Robinson. So I guess question one is, what's your best guess? What are your sort of your your expectations as to what she's going to say? I think it's going to be... Uh, eight games or less, Ross. I, I think the the whole idea that the NFL leaked that they want a year or an indefinite suspension was just to kind of see what the temperature was with, with the public. And, and I think they want everyone to know that they are looking for a very harsh penalty. I don't think Sue wants to go that overboard in her first ruling. Like this is the first time in the new process that she's going to make this decision. Nor do I think that whatever decision she makes, Roger Goodell is going to want to appeal for the NFL. Because again, this is her first one. I think everybody wants to let everyone know that we all have confidence in this new process. This was a collectively bargained process. And so I think she is, she's used to dealing with criticism. She's a former judge. Uh, She understands uh, when it gets hot in the kitchen, uh, how to handle it. And so I think whatever decision she makes, one, is going to be final. And I think, two, she's not going to be swayed based on any outside noise or outside activity. And so if I set the number at, at eight and a half, I would bet some of your money, all that, all that nice Ivy League money you got on the <laughs> under, and I would sleep very comfortably. What do you think it should be? Because that's a different question. It should be, Ross. <sighs> So here's where I go back. I, I, I try to take all the um, try to take all my personal feelings out of it. And here, here's what I look at. I, I look at two grand juries that have looked at what evidence they've had and they decided not to press any criminal charges. OK, so what does that mean? That means we get down to a, a, a civil issue where you have whatever the number is, 24, 28, 30 women that are uh, that are civilly suing him and, and ultimately civilly means hey we want some money or we want some type of restitution um and when it comes to that uh how can i suspend him for a year based on a civil suit now from a personal conduct policy and what he's done to i guess shame the league and shame the browns etc cetera, etc cetera, i do think there's some value there that warrants a suspension but ultimately, I come down, if you're going to suspend Calvin Ridley, and I get it, it's a different process, but if we're going to compare suspension, he bet 1500 bucks and you gave him an entire season. And, and betting money is kind of like the, um, like the biggest thing you can do when it comes to this league. Like betting on games is like the no-no. That, that's taboo. 
And so if, if that's the biggest thing that would really, really put a black eye on this league, I don't think civilly being sued by a player, even though the allegations are what they are, warrants a year. And that's why I come down, okay, it needs to be between six and eight games, and I think that's what it should be. Yeah, I mean, fascinating. Should be coming down any second um, what, or any what, any moment today. What do you I, think? I you and I always have this conversation. What do you think? Um, I think the reaction uh-huh. of the public is going to be very important. And so if it's four games and there's outrage, I disagree with you. And I think the NFL will appeal it and Goodell will increase it. I feel like there's a sweet spot where um, if it's eight games, I think that I think I don't want to say it's like a fair deal. It, it feels weird to talk about right. a situation like this with that, but I don't think there will be outrage if it's eight games. I think there will still be some people that s- say he shouldn't play all year, but there will be others that anything less than eight booger. I think you're going to get uh, four or less is going to be problematic. Six, I don't know. But I feel like eight is significant enough, you know, more or less half the season, significant enough that I that I think the NFL won't appeal it because there won't be a huge uproar. I think people will... I don't want to say settle, but I think people will be generally okay with eight games. There will be some people that think it's a little too much. There will be some people that think, you know, it's too light. He should get the whole year. But it's in the middle enough that I think both sides will be able to live with it, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. I I, I did think last night, just looking at some of the uh, Twitter sphere conversations, uh, and, and I read that during the, I guess, pre-decision negotiations, the NFL even threw out 12 games plus a hefty fine. Like, that's the first time I've heard that whole fine issue. And, and, and I think that's interesting because of the way they structured his contract, where he only makes a million dollars this year. And so it's a minimal amount based on uh, his per game uh, salary that he will lose depending on the games he suspended. So I'm wondering if, if they go six or eight games and let's say they find him 10 to $12 million uh, based on what the NFL PA said last night, that they would accept anything that Sue said today. I wonder if there's going to be a monetary amount to go with the game suspension that will kind of make everyone say, okay, we heard him in his wallet and we also heard him uh, where he can't play on the field. That'll be interesting to me. It's a really good point. Because I know that aspect of it bothered some people, right? Yeah. Like the fact that he was able to structure the contract in a way that he doesn't get hurt that much financially. So that 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 is interesting. Uh, speaking of interesting, Booger, what a week last week for Kyler Murray and the Arizona Cardinals. I mean, I don't even know where to start. I'm going to give you a blank canvas. The contract signed, comes out. He's got the homework clause. Kyler talks. The Cardinals issue a statement that they're going to remove the addendum. I guess I want to start at the start with them having this clause in his contract in the first place and your thoughts and reaction to that. Well, that tells me, first of all, that there's some hesitancy based on what they know with him in the building and how he prepares and how he studies for games. That's the only reason you put that in there. Like, I've never seen it in a contract before. The only reason it's in there is because they want it to happen and they also want to embarrass the player a little bit. And here's why I say that, Ross, is because that conversation could have easily been had uh, in in a room at the Cardinals facility. Hey, listen, as we enter into this new partnership, Um, we have a couple of things that we need you to work on. You know, you sent us a letter back in February basically saying, 
hey, we're not playing anymore. We want a new deal. And, and you made that letter public. Well, we want you to study a little bit more. We want you to be in the building a little bit more. We want you to fix your attitude. We want you to be the ultimate professional. And they could have easily had that meeting behind closed doors and nobody ever finds out. But the fact that they put this in a contract where everyone knows that as soon as that contract is filed, everybody's going to see it. They wanted the public to know, hey, yeah, they sent us a letter and it kind of looks like we uh, met their demands. But just so you know, we're going to pay him. But here's what we're dealing with. And here's our hesitancy in paying this young man is because he doesn't work quite as hard. And I don't care what they say with, with the blowback and taking the claws out. The damage is already done. Just like that letter they sent in February, the damage is already done, Ross. And, and, and for me, I just think that um, if you're Kyler Murray, you, you, you got to feel really, really, I don't know, you got to feel good that you got your $160 million guarantee, but you also have to feel some type of way about how you're perceived in your own building. I mean, I guess maybe he already knew that to some level, but that is awkward, really awkward. It's one of those things, Ross, where I, I think when you, when you look at Kyler, first of all, I don't know about you. I don't know if I would have paid Kyler. And here's what I mean by this. Kyler's played three years. He had a fourth year plus a fifth year team option. They could have franchised him two more years after that. So, Ross, the Cardinals had four years of control where Kyler could do nothing about it. So why do you have to pay a guy that at, at best, I'm not going to say you're lukewarm on, but you, have, you still have questions about? That's the thing I don't understand. You put this addendum in the contract, which clearly states that you're not 100% all in on everything he does, then why pay him? Well, you got four more years of control. I think the agent and the, the letter was a strategic play because they knew this, and they knew that, guess what? This team doesn't have to pay us, but how do we create, in the court of a public opinion, uh, how do we create leverage for ourselves? And, and good on Kyle and his agent because – I think based on the fact that Burkhart got a contract for Cliff Kingsbury and Steve Kahn got a new contract, that we all know Kyler is basically tied to uh, those two, that they kind of forced the Cardinals into a contract. At least that's the way I see it. I, I don't know about you. Well, because I want to get to these hold-ins a little bit. Sure. But it seems, it seems like it's just not a – you're right. They did have four years of control. But once he scrubs his social media, once his agent puts out that letter, is it is it really worth it to have a malcontent quarterback? I just think, and really any star player, but especially quarterback, yes, they could have done what you did, but what, what you said. But they obviously already have concerns about his preparation. Mm -hmm. Do they want – are they better off over the next four years or however many years going, you know, year to year and him being unhappy and this being an issue hovering over them? I think they ultimately decided their best chance to win these next couple of years was just to give him a new deal as opposed to, you know, doing the year to year thing. Yeah. I agree with that, and that's a good point. I think the other bigger picture, as we've seen Kyler Murray get his new deal, we're waiting on the Lamar Jackson contract. You have Herbert and Burrow coming, we uh, assume, after next season. Uh, and then there's the outlier Deshaun Watson contract of $230 million fully guaranteed. I just think, Ross, that the owners and the general managers are doing an outstanding job of using the leverage that they have and I don't think we're ever going to see another fully guaranteed contract. And, and I think the Kyler Murray situation, the Lamar Jackson contract negotiation, because these teams have all the leverage. If I negotiate after year three, and I know that I basically have four more years of control on a first round pick, why would I ever kowtow and give you 230, 240, 250 million fully guaranteed? I think the Deshaun Watson contract is going to continue to be an outlier. And I, and I think that unless there is a player that is willing to go the Kirk Cousins route, which is play on the tag year by year, or he is a non-first-round pick where he only has a four-year deal, I think we're going to look back and, and everybody's going to wait on 
and everybody's waiting on Kyler and Lamar and all these other guys. I just don't think we're ever going to get to a point where the owners and the teams feel like they don't have enough leverage where they have to bow down and give players, mainly quarterbacks, fully guaranteed money. The funniest part of the Cardinals thing to me is the statement they issued saying, now that they see the reaction, they're going to remove <laughs> the addendum. Right. What, what, what did they think the reaction would be? Oh, that's why, that's why this is funny, man. That's, you know, this is one of those things like we're all trying to trying to win the PR battle, right? Like, like anytime we put something on social media, or we put out a message, we are really just testing the temperature and, and the Cardinal statement, again, as we discussed, they knew what they wanted to do. They wanted to publicly humiliate the player. They did it. So now, sure, let's take it out. Let's bow down. Let's apologize and let's move on. But again, the damage is already done. It, it, this is one of those things now where, Ross, when you and I played, uh, we didn't necessarily try to win the court of public opinion. We just tried to win. Nowadays, it's not even about that. Like, if, if I can win the social media war for the day or, or if I can win – the headline for today, then it's worth me doing X. And I think that's one of the things that these players now who live their life on Instagram and social media, whereas we didn't, I think they are, they make decisions based on that. And that's always going to be interesting and new to me. So you, uh, we were tweeting back and forth at ESPN Booger at Ross Tucker NFL about how, how normal these hold-ins are now, Booger. I mean, I'm yeah. going to talk in a couple minutes about the Debo Samuel contract, the DK Metcalf contract. There are still other guys, Roquan Smith, Deontay Johnson, Derwin James. You know, it's kind of interesting that this many guys are holding in, and it seems like it works. It's like... It seems like it's better than holding out. It's a way where I can satisfy the CBA and not get the $14,000 fine per day. It's also a way I can show and save good face by showing my teammates I'm here. But as, as a teammate, I also know there's a business component to this. And I'm here for you guys. And as soon as they pay, it, it kind of puts the pressure back on the team. Hey, guys, I'm here. There's no other place I'd rather be. I'm with you but I'm not going to do what you're doing, which is practicing right now until I get taken care of financially. And I think that's, that's smart. It's a way to circumnavigate. And I think the owners don't like it, but right now under this collective bargaining agreement, what are they going to do? There's really nothing they can do. And it's smart by the players. Now, again, I guarantee you, uh, we always try to put band-aids on things. The next time there's a negotiation, they are going to try to put something in there where you can't, hold out, nor can you hold in. But for right now, this is smart on the players, and I think the players have a little bit of leverage. By the way, I'm, I'm sorry for your listeners because we haven't talked about this uh, so far, but your voice sounds terrible, dude. Like, like it, it sounds awful. And, and for you to be a professional, that I know you are, to come on and, and do this show, and, and it, it's clear your preparation wasn't what it needed to be because your voice sounds bad. I'm just like, things have changed over the year. Like th there was a point in time where you would have been ready to go at 6 a.m. waiting on me. Now you log on at 7.30, your voice sounds terrible. It's amazing what happens when you get all this money and all these jobs you have. It's amazing how you've changed, big guy. <laughs> so um, it's amazing what happens when you were um, on the stage at a Jason Aldean concert last night and uh, – Went to bed at 2 a.m. So, look, I'm prepared. <laughs> I'm prepared. I'm professional. This is like my second cup of uh, hot tea. I've got the entertainer's secret I'm squirting. Yeah, I, 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 that's great in the stuff. the back of my way. throat. I'm all in, man. I, I, I'm all in. Hey, last thing. I'm going to the Hall of Fame next weekend. Yeah. Um, Tony, Tony Baselli invited me to his enshrinement. So I'm excited about that. I'm pretty sure you've gone maybe a couple times, but I wanted your thoughts on two D linemen getting in that were contemporaries of yours, mm -hmm. Bryant Young and Richard Seymour. What do you remember those guys? Obviously you overlapped a bunch of years and you saw them on tape quite a bit. Um, Brian Young was kind of that, that first three technique where, 
not only could he rush the pass, but he, he was pretty dominant against the run also. Um, and I think he was as adept at doing both. Whereas you look at some of the guys in, in recent history, they, they're dominant, but they may not have the, the same prowess against the run that he had. Just, just an unbelievable force. Consistency comes to mind. He did it for a long, long time. And just one of the greatest human beings I've ever met, Ross. Just unbelievable person. When you talk to him, he makes you forget how good of a player that he was based on how soft-spoken he is and what he stands for. Uh, Richard Seymour, Ross, have you ever met a bigger human being from a defensive lineman standpoint? Like, I would have loved to see seen him forklift you and just, like, chunk you like a rag doll because he's bigger than you. Like, he, it, I mean, his arms are so long. And it just goes to show you that if you watch the game and watch the tape, you can dominate the game as a D lineman in more ways than just getting sacks. Because he played in that 3-4 system, and it's not a huge system where you're going to just put up 15 sacks a year. But he played in that in that two-gap, that four-eye, that five technique. Man, and he was just a load to deal with. Uh, he, he commandeered two guys all the time. And, and I think – you know, he got the ultimate respect from the New England Patriots when, you know, Bill Belichick and, and how they played him, uh, they literally would allow him to two-gap and take on take care of one side of the field. And then there are not a lot of players you put that kind of responsibility on. So uh, another consistent performer, long time coming. Congrats to those two, uh, two guys. And as someone who didn't uh, amount 100 sacks in their career, it's good to see players who played the game at a high level uh, that may, may not have the quote unquote gaudy numbers, but when you understand how the game works and how they played the game, it's good to see them get rewarded. Check him out on social media. He is the man at ESPN Booger. Good to see you. Thank you for busting my chops like every time I ever interact with you. Uh, I really appreciate it, man. Ross, glad to be with you. And, and, and another thing, maybe try this. Take the silver spoon out that you've had since you went to the Ivy League, and maybe that'll help with the voice also. So, hey, I love you, pal. It, it, it's, it's been way too long. Let's do it again soon. Sounds great. Thanks, man. There he is, Booger McFarland. Uh, obviously, we're friends. Really, really enjoy that. Um, you know what else I enjoy, by the way? Dealing with the professionals at Simply Safe. Whether it's their support staff, a monitoring agent, it's just nice that your security company, okay, the alarm goes off, they call. They're just nice. They're courteous. And if you call them, they answer right away. Not every other security company is like that. Trust me. Simply Safe puts customers first. Plus, there's no long term contract. Never upcharges or hidden fees. You can customize the perfect system for your home in just a few minutes at simplysafe.com slash Tucker. Go today and claim a free indoor security camera plus 20% off with interactive monitoring. That's simplysafe.com slash Tucker. There's no safe like Simply Safe. Tux takes. Hey Ross, good morning. Let's start with Deshaun Watson. The suspension ruling from Susan Robinson expected to come down today. Uh, also, Watson settled three more cases, leaving just one outstanding. Right. So Booger and I talked about the suspension stuff, and I gave my thoughts. It is interesting the timing again of settling these lawsuits. And the fact there's only one left. I mean, he's so close to having the legal issues behind him. He still just has that one outstanding, um, which is interesting to know who that person is and why they're still outstanding. Tux takes. Also, that uh, from what you and Booger talked about, Cardinals announced that they will remove the homework clause from Kyler Murray's contract after he says it's disrespectful for people to question his work ethic. Well, I mean, then the Cardinals are being disrespectful to him. I mean, 
I don't know who he's talking to, but then the Cardinals are the ones being disrespectful to him. And then they haven't actually done it yet. They haven't actually filed a new contract yet or removed the addendum. So I wonder if they just said that publicly, but don't actually end up removing it. That's something to watch because you got to file a new contract. Tux takes. Both DK Metcalf and Debo Samuel signed big three year extensions worth close to $25 million per year. It's unreal, man. It is unreal. You know, these receivers, after just three years, are getting huge guarantees. Debo is like almost $60 million. DK Metcalf got like a $30 million signing bonus. It's remarkable. I mean, the NFL is telling us that wide receiver is essentially, I don't know, the third most important position in the NFL. Seems like it goes quarterback one, edge rushers like TJ Watt and Bosa two, and then receivers. That's a lot of money. You know, it used to be the thought process that receivers weren't that much of a difference maker and that the scheme got them open and you could find guys like the Patriots had with guys like David Gibbons or whatever. Not anymore. Uh, these teams obviously feel like these guys are vitally, vitally important. Tux takes. Meanwhile, Orlando Brown has signed his franchise tag and will report to practice today. That's interesting because I kind of thought he would wait a while because that's part of the value of not signing the franchise tag is you're able to just chill and not have to go to training camp. But I guess they start padded practices today and he feels like it's important to the team that he's part of it. Andy Reid probably relayed that to him. So he feels like he should show up. So he's going to. So I don't know. I mean, it's up to him. More power to him. I don't know what I would do. I really don't. I mean, I, honestly, I probably would have signed the franchise tag right away to guarantee that money. But he waited this long. I don't know. I might have waited a couple more weeks. Tux takes. Daniel Snyder finally testified before Congress. Your thoughts? Nothing, like there were no leaks. We we learned nothing other than the fact that it was like an all day thing. No information came out about what was said, which I think is interesting because usually information always gets out. And I thought those things were public, so I, I don't know why we don't have any information. Um, that that's an interesting one to me. Tux takes. Tampa Bay Bucks need a new uh, center. Ryan Jensen goes down with a knee injury at practice. He's out for months. Right. It sounds like he's probably out for the year. They'll look at internal candidates for a few days and see how those guys do. But ultimately, I would expect them to probably try to sign a guy like J.C. Treader because whoever the internal candidates are, they don't want to have a new left guard and a center who's never played before. That's not conducive to success. Treader is a pro's pro. And then even if they like the Hainsey kid, that way they have some depth. You know, they, they need depth. That's important. Tux takes. And lastly, the Cowboys sign USFL MVP Cavante Turpin. The Jets sign linebacker Quan Alexander. And the Chiefs sign Carlos Dunlap. Probably the most interesting of those is Carlos Dunlap because he can still play. I mean, maybe Quan Alexander can as well, but Quan has had a lot of health issues, had trouble staying healthy. But Carlos Dunlap was still a force last year, a lot. And so it makes sense for the Chiefs to add him to Frank Clark and Karloftis, the rookie they take they took in the first round. So um, pretty interesting. Shout-outs, by the way, are in order. They always are. Pizza Boy Brewing, Sportaculture, 
humanheadnyc.com, steakhousesports.com, go-bangles.com, and evergreen economics. I think we're done here. Thanks for listening to the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. Make sure to also subscribe to the Fantasy Feast, Even Money, Business of Sports, and College Draft. All available at Apple Podcasts, RossTucker.com, or wherever podcasts can be found.